Right, should I do my first one all then? I'd love to hear it. Right, okay, I've got this right now. Okay, yeah, th this could be a long ramble, this. I've been thinking a lot about behavior. And the reason I want to discuss this with you is you you know a lot more about behavior than me. Because I've read Tools for Teachers. You talk a lot about norms and things like that in there. I think you're kind of work, currently working. We spoke off mic uh, at the end of last episode on some behavior, potentially a project that you're working on there that you can feel free to talk a little bit more about. So behaviors me, and I don't consider myself knowledgeable about behavior at all. When I look back on my teaching, I don't think my behavior management was particularly good. Certainly when I moved school, oh God almighty, the kid, I'd never met kids like this when I moved into my second school. I couldn't, couldn't control them at all. My teaching just absolutely nosedive. So I've got three reflections on behavior that I go through one, two, three, then I'll hand over to you just in case there's anything you want to kind of uh, come back on it on this. So the first is that I think you only know how good behavior can be when you've seen it in action. And this may seem like the most obvious thing you've ever seen in your life, but I as heard in your life, sorry. But I used to think that when I was teaching full-time in my school in Bolton, behavior in my classes was pretty good. But it's only, it was only whenever you hear people, like when I interviewed Danny Quinn from Michaela and she described her lessons, I thought, all right, okay, mine are nowhere near that. But then just this last week, I've been in a school, and I'll give them a shout out, actually, Cardinal Hume School, and it's in Gateshead, which is in the northeast of England. Real tough area. Like, I'm not talking any kind of leafy suburb, you know, angels as kids or anything like that. These are tough kids. But the behavior I was in, I was in all day in lessons. The behavior was unbelievable. The routines that they had in place, tough kids, and they were getting in, in, I think the lessons were an hour and they might have been 50 minutes, but I'd say at most one minute of that was not dedicated to teaching and learning. You know, you know, maybe you'd have to tell a kid just to make, are you listening? Blah, blah, blah. The rest of it was, was unbelievable. And it's whenever you come away from places like that and you think this is how it, ha this is how it should be. It like the kids, they've, they've got every chance in the world here. If, if the behavior is that good, the teacher can teach and the kids can learn and, and so on and so forth. And it reminded me, I listened to one of your podcasts where you just got back. I think it was from your first trip to England or it might've been your second. And you were saying you'd never seen, you never realized teaching can be as good as it can be as when you visited some of these schools in the UK and the behavior just plays an integral role in that. So that's my kind of first observation that you may think behavior in your school and classes are good, but my God, there are some places out there that have managed to get it to a whole new level. So that, that's number one. The second thing, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. So I've been in some schools recently where behavior's not been good at all. And it's really interesting. This may be a big generalization, but one thing really common in those schools is they have behavior policies along the lines of, to put a generalization, kind of three strikes and you're right, out. And it'll be something along the lines of, like a kid's shout someone out or whatever or pushes someone or something like that it's like all right let me put your name on the board so the teacher stops what they're doing for a start turns around and pops you know the kid's name on the board and then five minutes later the kid chucks a pen or something oh that's your second one so puts like a second kind of tick next to this kid's name and it's only when they get to the third one sometimes even the fourth one that actually something happens like the kid gets sent out or, or whatever um and there's, there's different versions of this. Um, at one school I used to teach in, there's like a C1, C2, C3, C4. And C1's like a verbal warning. C2's like a written warning. But it's this whole escalation thing. And the kids are loving it. The kids are loving it because they know they, they, can, they can piss about a couple of times before they actually have to do anything. And then uh, it reminded me of your kind of tools for teachers where you talk about norms. It's actually quite quite good to be on the board. You're quite cool if you're on the board. A few names, oh, there's a load of names on the board. I best get myself on the board and all this. And... I've been thinking a lot about attention recently. I've just put a, I'm putting a newsletter out tomorrow about attention. Like the fact that a teacher's midway through an explanation has to stop, write a name on the board, then try and resume where they're at and get all the kids back. It's just an absolute disaster. So yeah, I'm very interested in what you've seen work in trickier schools in terms of that. Have you seen this kind of behavior system where it's, you know, almost kind of an escalation, but the kids essentially get quite a few chances before anything actually happens to them? And can you go, like, let's say you're in one of those schools and then you went in tomorrow and said, look, this is a disaster. So we're having kind of a, you've no chances or, you, you know, you've one chance. 
you can imagine what's going to happen there. Every kid's in detention because like it's such a big shift. So how on earth do you kind of come away from that? So I'm interested in that. I'm not expecting you to solve this all, but just, just a reflection. And then the final, final one is, so just to recap for listeners here, I've got, you've, you've, you need to see what good behavior can be. Secondly, I'm not convinced by these kind of C1, C2, you know, three strikes and you're out systems. But the third one is I saw a really interesting case this week in a school and I'd never seen anything like this in my life. The kids were silent, right? So I was stood outside a lesson with the deputy head who was, oh, sorry, the head of maths who was taking me around. And she said, right, we'll go in this room now. And I'm thinking, well, there's nobody in this room because I couldn't hear anything. I could not hear a peep. And I went in and sure enough, there was year 10s there. They were sat in silence, kind of working away. And I thought, wow, bloody hell, this is unbelievable. But, and this is the big twist in the story, I've never seen such passivity in my entire life. The kids were quiet, but in terms of learn, you ask them a question, they didn't have a clue. They didn't have a clue. And the teacher would ask a question out. Nobody's volunteering, doing a cold call. They're like, kids like, I don't know. So they're quiet. And on the face of it, you could think, oh, this is ideal. But in terms of what they're actually understanding and in terms of how much learning was going on, yeah, I, I wasn't convinced. And the head of the department wasn't convinced as well. And that's a whole different problem, how you solve that. This is how you solve the kind of second case where behavior is a bit out of control and you've got these kind of systems in place. So there's kind of three reflections on behavior all. I don't know what you make of any of them. I'll hand over to okay, you. Craig. And this, I mean, this is a whole podcast. Of course it is. Of course it is. Of course it is. Can I, I'll just go, I'll go backwards. Of course, mate. The most recent one. Could I ask a bit about like the, the kind of context yeah. of that, that final school? Like what was the... I guess the cultural makeup, how well did the students know each other? What was common the factors there? It's a great question. And this is another massive broad generalization. I'd be interested if this is the same in ours, right? Um, So these, this school um, that I talked about last, the one where the kids were quiet and the first school where they were quiet, but mass, like whenever you ask them stuff, they were onto it because they were definitely listening. They're both Catholic schools and I'm going to make a massive broad generalization here and listeners can have a go at me. That that doesn't really matter. Um, I think that... In general, Catholic schools, the behavior tends to be better than any other faith school I've visited and certainly non-faith schools. And it's really interesting. I spoke to the head teacher about this because I said, look, this is what I've noticed. And she goes, yeah, no, I think that's true. And I said, why the hell is this happening? And she said that whilst all schools can say, look, it's important to be a good person. It's important to respect others, respect your teachers and all that kind of thing. The kind of advantage that her theory was that Catholic schools have is they can refer to the gospel to say, look, this is our point of reference. This is why this is our kind of our common document, why we need to be a good person. And they talk about it all the time. And I said, but any school can do that, right? Any school can have a set of values printed out and say, this is what we need to refer to. But her thinking was, it seems to be a big cliche. It seems to come from some kind of like higher power, this, you know, this kind of the the gospel versus a set of school rules. And she said, look, we constantly talk about it all the time. Now, I'm sure I'm going to more Catholic schools um, in June. I could go into somewhere it's riots are happening, I'm sure. But just as a general print, general rule, the behavior seems to be a lot more. Yeah, the kids seem to be a lot more kind of respectful, settled and and yeah, better relationships with teachers. I don't know. Is that is that would you see any of that in ours? Oh, look, I'd I'd say I probably haven't been into enough Catholic schools to kind of recognize a trend yeah. in the same way that you feel you have. So I wouldn't wouldn't feel qualified sure. to comment on that. But um let's let me start from the top and then we'll yeah, yeah. Circle, circle back down to this bottom one. So the first one, uh, you only know how good behavior can be when you've seen it in action. Yeah, could not agree more. And mm. like you said, that for me, the lesson, big lesson came around teaching and behavior basically at the same time when I saw it in the UK. Um, in my, it was my first trip and then the second one as well back last year. The only thing I, well, the main thing I want to add on here is like, this isn't only true for teachers that you only know how good behavior can be um, until, when you've seen it in action, but it's also true for students. Mm. So students actually, because <laughs> often, you know, for us, we've been in a number of schools Quite a few teachers have been in more than one school, but for many students, they've only been in one school. Yeah, and so point. that their whole view of like what it means to behave, they've only seen the spectrum of behavior in their school. And some kids, you know, it's only the nerds who behave or whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so actually giving a student an ability to, to see phenomenal behavior uh, is incredibly powerful. I mean, one way that I've seen some schools do this is to like find the best behaved class um, within your own school. Yeah. 
and take videos of them uh, and then use that as a, like a training resource for year sevens coming in. Uh, it could be effective. I haven't yeah. actually come across a school that takes video from another school. Yeah. Uh, I think there would be like there's some really interesting dynamics around that. Um, but I think that would be really interesting. There was a really interesting episode of This American Life. I can't remember what it was called, but I can dig it out for the show notes where they did actually send students to different schools. Wow. And it had really um, interesting effects on their kind of their beliefs and understanding. And actually for the students from low SES school going to a richer school, it was actually very demotivating for them because they thought this is like, how, how the heck are we supposed to compete with this? There's these rich kids with this phenomenal education and like, we're just stuff, basically. So I think you've also got to be careful how you do it. Um, but yeah, it's not just true for teachers. It's also true for students. Uh, your second point on like the three strikes and your out policies and students kind of muck about until they get to the third strike. <laughs> yeah, this is so common. And this is, look, this has happened in my own class a lot of times as well. I'm, I'm you know, I'll be the, be the first to admit it. Uh, a few things I could say here. One thing is, I, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with like a strikes system i think what needs to happen though is actually every strike needs to count mm. so i mean in in the really high expectation schools i visited in the uk uh basically they use a demerit system in a lot of the cases and so you know maybe perhaps three demerits in a particular class will have an immediate effect in that class like mm. you'll have to leave that class but irrespective like regardless of it whether it does or not the demerits still accrue and you're still going to see the head of year or something like that once you have a certain number of demerits, demerits whether or not they happen over a term or whatever so i think that can help one one way i've done that in my own classroom is like if you're if your name's on the board at all or if i've recorded your name at all in the whole lesson you're like helping me clean up at the end of the lesson or there, there is some kind of consequence and that's something that teachers can do if their whole school if they're not within in a school that has like a whole school policy but i mean that's another thing for that behavior um and kind of demerit kind of an approach like a lot of the time it really depends upon having a whole school approach where yeah. stuff is actually followed up by senior leadership and if it isn't it kind of all falls in a big heap so that's absolutely crucial as well and i know a bit of greg ashman's kind of advice for for new teachers is when you're being interviewed at a school ask what the behavior policy is and if they don't have a good one you know <laughs> leave because it can be the difference between a, of course a, you know a rewarding career and like depression and like quitting and like you know feeling really bad about yourself so and, um, and, and just then, on that, Ollie, how did you manage the logistics of that? Like, just physically recording the kid's name on the board. That get in the way, though. Oh, oh, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Um, I, I actually, I've now I just do it on a clipboard because mm. you lose that kind of um, and and that's what the vast majority of the schools I visit in the UK do. Uh, in fact, some of the schools have a student recording it oh example, wow they'll get one of the higher achieving students to be the demerit recorder <laughs> demerit and merit recorder and the teacher we just go harry that's a demerit and we'll keep teaching and that means they don't have to stop and then that that student who they've already decided has the you know cognitive ability or like yeah. working memory resources to both listen to and also record demerits we'll do it and so that's i mean that's an interesting it's a twist approach. yeah yeah um but i you know actually i saw that at michaela but i also saw some teachers at michaela who said oh i don't want to do it that way because I feel like it's compromising the learning of that one yeah. student. So yeah, yeah. it's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing. But yeah, I think I think taking it off the board and putting on a clipboard is probably a step in the right direction. Um, and then you can use the board for like you know writing up the five people who've started the started the start of the quickest or something like yeah. that. Use it in a positive way is a lot better, I think. Um, and the final thing I want to add on this kind of three strikes and out policies is um, Indranil Goswami has done some good research on this. He's got a paper. It's called The Dynamic Effects of Incentives on Post-Reward Task Engagement. The Dynamic mm. Effect of Incentives, so, you know, merits could be incentives, on post-reward, so when the rewards want to run out, um, task engagement. And basically, the basic point of it is that, um, and this relates to you talking about, like, norms, and surely norms are better than these kind of systems of demerits or, or names on the board. Um, these systems can be really effective, in the sh especially in the short term when you're trying to change the norms of a school. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a behavior reset or something like that, eventually it's ideal if you get to a place where they're, they're rarely used. It's, it's unlikely you get to a place where they're never used, but ideally you get to a place where they're rarely used and the, the norms and the culture are supporting it. But when you're in a transition phase and you're tr really trying to change things around, I think that um, they can be a really valuable and important tool. Um, especially when used um, with some of, the, in some of the ways we've just been talking about. And the final one, like the, the kids were silent idea. 
and the, the passivity that you saw. My experience has been the classes in which that passivity um, reigns supreme the most are the ones in which the students actually don't really know each other very well. Oh. Um, and and that's been my personal experience because um, a, a school that I've taught in, I've had groups of students who knew each other really well and the school had a pretty good culture of student mm. behavior anyway. And so in classes where they knew each other well, they'd be happy to volunteer answers, um, you know, speak loudly when cold called upon, stand and deliver, things like that. But in the ones where they didn't know each other, it was a lot scarier. And I actually realized that I needed to do some like team building exercises yes. to get the kids to actually know each other's names and things like that. So I think that may not have been the, the issue in, in the scenario that you were in, but I, I know in my own classroom, that has been an issue and a barrier to kind of participation and a lack of passivity in the past. So that might be one approach for some teachers in that context. It's really interesting. And just, I did some... Um did some CPD with the teachers in this school after I'd spent the day kind of watching lessons. And it was, it was a bit tough. I asked a tough question and it's a, again, a, and I, every time I ask, you know, do CPD, I always say, as I'm sure you do as well, look, we've all made these mistakes, right? Um, you know, I'm not coming at this as any kind of expert at all, but the question I want to ask is how do you know your kids understand what you're saying, what their partner's saying and anything like that? Because it was very easy in this school to be a, t a kid and just stay under the radar the whole day long because you could just sit there and the teacher was given explanations and in the teacher's head, they're probably thinking this explanation is brilliant. All the kids are probably understanding and maybe the teacher says, everybody understand this and nobody says they don't. So they just kind of crack on and it's, yeah, it was just a, it was a completely different challenge than I normally get when the bigger challenge is, look, it's clear some kids aren't listening because they're talking to their mate or whatever. Here, to all intents and purposes, it really looked like the kids were listening. They're all watching. They're all looking at the front, but there was no evidence that they were. It was, yeah, it was an interesting one. No, that was great. Really useful reflections. Thanks for that, all. Um.